Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. Today, we are talking about audiation, which literally means to think music. Now, teachers who use audiation and its accompanied music learning theory say that it's the perfect way to teach students and to help them deepen their musical understanding from the very beginning of their musical training. And here to talk with us about that is my guest, Siliana Shiliashka, who uses music learning theory and audiation in her teaching in her own private piano studio. Siliana is a dedicated music educator who has performed and taught piano throughout North America, Canada, and Europe. She debuted as a soloist with the Vratza Philharmonic Orchestra in Bulgaria when she was 10 years old. A graduate of the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, Canada, Siliana holds a bachelor and a master's degree in piano performance. She is a recipient of numerous scholarships, including the UCSB Music Affiliates Quarterly Performance Award, the SB Music Club, and she's an awardee of several competitions and festivals in Bulgaria, Canada, and the U.S. So, Siliana, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, I'm very happy to to see you and to chat with you. I, um, I've been wanting to talk with you ever since I saw some videos of your piano teaching on social media. And I just loved the way your students were internalizing their music and the way that you were interacting with your students. And I did a little research into it. And your teaching method uses audiation which I know nothing about. So can you explain what audiation is? Yeah, so audiation is a term uh, that wasn't always in the dictionary. <laughs> it was <laughs> coined by the researcher Edwin Gordon. And uh, it basically means to comprehend, to hear and comprehend music um, that for which the sound is not present or may have never been present. So it's very different than I think sometimes people compare it to inner hearing or imitation, but it's um, the difference is that with audiation, you actually understand what you're hearing and you can understand it on many different levels uh, from very uh, many different aspects. So there are many things we can audiate in music. We can audiate uh, tonal patterns, rhythm patterns, but also we can audiate style, timbre, phrasing, um, all kinds of things. <laughs> so many, many uh, things, elements of, of music that we can audiate. Uh, but the ones that we focus on mostly is uh, uh, rhythm and, and tonal. Okay. And so this is, that's something that we as musicians and as just as normal people, this is something that we do all the time, right? Yes. So now absolutely. how, good. So how are, how do you, incorporate that into your teaching. So is that is, is that something that you're training into your students, just like being more cognizant of it? What's the difference? Yeah. Well, it I think it's it's um I think as musicians we do audiate on certain levels for sure. And eventually we figure it out. Uh but I think what we've missed, a lot of us have missed in our earlier training is you know beginning with audiation beginning with um training our ear in a way that will make us better musicians um and and lifetime musicians and independent musicians and really in a way that we can find a lot more joy and meaning in our music making so is that how you learned piano as well no <laughs> no oh. <laughs> not at all <laughs> So um, it's not that I didn't experience joy when I was a student. I went to a, a specialty music school, which for which you audition when you're five or six years old. I did when I was six, just turned six. And ironically, my first teacher was a composer and he was an arranger. He was quite amazing. I know he was commissioned to do many works uh, across the country. And he did many arrangements for me to to play with the or local orchestra and but he never taught me how to do any of that. He never taught me improvisation or, you know, ar arranging or composing skills. Um, and because it was a specialty school, we went to piano lessons. I think it was twice a week that we did piano lessons. And once or twice a week, we did solfege, which was um, 
in, in that particular school was about uh, developing our ear, but it was more of a theoretical thing. So we would... I feel like it was almost aimed at developing perfect pitch because all of us had perfect pitch. And I, to this day, I can't figure out if it was something that happened as a result of the training system or maybe oh. it was something that we had um, maybe a potential for. But I know I didn't have perfect pitch before I started, you know, my musical classes there. So um, anyway... <laughs> Um, I learned, we learned very complex things, uh, such as taking four part dictation, um, you know, writing dictation from listening and singing, you know, in four part style and labeling chords like with no Roman numerals uh, when we were eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, I didn't think that that served me at all because in my music making, otherwise, you know, with my piano teacher, we didn't really ever discuss. The things, the elements that we were learning uh, in my solfege class classes, and it's like I never made the connection, and that makes me very sad because if I had made the connection, then I would have had a much more solid memory, uh, probably would have been much more comfortable performing from memory and just performing in general. I think the more we understand about what we're doing, the more confidence and joy we experience in performing and i think that's the base issue that i see with students is that you know they just don't um they're very nervous because a lot of the the their learning process is centered around what their teacher tells them to do and some of them are exceptionally good at imitation at imitating and they get far that way uh but you know, the emphasis is not on audiation. The emphasis is not on creativity and understanding. Applying audiation to music making, gotcha. which has a big so, element of improvisation. Okay. So now when you're teaching now, you're making a much more confit, conscious effort to bring in that audiation. So how does that look different? Are you still teaching solfege to your students just in a different way or is it completely different? It is in a different way, partly because my studio hasn't switched completely to the, you know, 100% audiation based studio. I'm not a studio like that just yet. It is my dream to be because, um, but I think sometimes we have to meet students halfway um, and sometimes we have to meet parents expectations halfway. Sometimes parents want their kids to be able to do exams early on, which is an issue because we don't start music reading from day one. And it's sound before sight. And I know I had a lot of misconceptions about this before I knew about it, before I knew the reasons why it was such a great thing. And I myself had reservations to teaching in this way because I wasn't sure what's the long-term implications were. <laughs> yeah, and so I think how a lot of people have a question about that. Yes, I actually have a question about that too. I wonder if it's, you know, sound before sight. I, I just think about my own training and how I was taught the musical symbols like rhythm, how to read from day one. That was, you know, very ground into me. So I'm a very good sight reader now. And I wonder if concentrating on sound before sight makes gives those students a little bit of a disadvantage but have you seen that at all or no I don't think so because we don't actually hide notation from them we show notation from the very first lesson we just don't present notation in such a decoding kind of way so we you know, you, we show the notation to the student. We uh, expose them to a lot of informal guidance with notation, um, but we don't read symbol by symbol, which to me is a, is a big problem because that's that's where you get a lot of robotic playing from early beginners, and sometimes that can translate to a very long time of playing that way, um, and also just perceiving music on a level of note note to note bases or more vertical even when you start learning learning more notes like chords it's a lot of it is too vertical sometimes 
Um, and I think that's a problem with starting to label chords too early or starting or just thinking about music theory and, and analysis from the standpoint of Roman numeral analysis and, and not so much, you know, uh, the interweaving voices and, and more of a linear analysis as well that goes together with the more vertical approach that we're used to on our theory exams. Yes. Yeah. So, so walk me through this then. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because you're introducing the, you're introducing the notation in an informal way. And then you are promoting listening and singing and improvisation and getting the kids to really internalize. Can you walk me through what a lesson looks like? Yes. We always start with um, movement, some, some kind of a movement activity that goes together with um, singing. And uh, that's kind of warms up our mind and body to music, to rhythm and to tone. And the those activities are infinite <laughs> in number. And there are many, many resources that I, I use. And so we can also, of course, create our own once we understand uh, how to apply music learning theory and the tenets of music learning theory. We can certainly begin to create our own resources for for this uh but this is how we start we always start away from the instrument um and then after we've done some of that we depending on where we are in the learning process um i also throw in some rhythm patterns and some tonal patterns to the student in which you've probably seen some of my videos uh that demonstrate this the student would chant back or sing back the rhythm or tonal pattern they may i may ask them to do it exactly the same so um you know repeat the same pattern or i may want to work on them um singing back the resting tone or keeping the resting tone which is another way to call the tonic of the you know of the pattern Uh, and, or I may ask them to sing just the first pitch. So basically to, for them to audiate the first pitch of the whole pattern, which is usually made up of three, uh, two to four notes. Um, and then, or I may ask them to improvise back to me. So if I say, and they all say something like, they may say something like that because I asked them to play something or to chant something different. Um, then we would move on to the piano and uh, we would either have more movement activities, uh, but now that are in the context of the piece or pieces that we're about to learn. Sometimes we start the piano portion with a review. Review is really important. So reviewing old pieces and finding as many ways to use them with in creative ways, such as mashing them up, uh, creating, uh, you know, bridging them together, thinking about all the pieces that we've done, and maybe there's something similar between two or three of the pieces that we've done so far, and connecting them together, um, composing introductions or, you know, uh, endings to them, composing uh, bridges between the different pieces. So again, the possibilities there are endless and I like to spend as much time on this as as possible because this is kind of um, for, you know, it shows the student that there's so much more they can do with a piece of music that at first sight is very simple and they can be probably be learned very quickly, but that you can go so much deeper and you can learn so many skills by toying around with something so simple. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. And then we may go back to the floor. So that's called activity time too. (laughs) And we may do some more uh, experiences with different tonalities. So that's a very important aspect of music learning theory that um, we expose children to or any age learner to different tonalities, not just major and minor, but all the modes. And uh, we may do some of, some more of that, but that's usually a brief period of time. And then we go back to the piano and it's, you know, the time when we learn something new. Uh, and that can stretch for a while. <laughs> it can stretch over more than one class. Uh, it can be just the beginning of 
exposing the student to listening to the piece, uh, maybe keeping a single uh, beat on a single set, like a resting tone while they listen. Uh, again, the activities there are endless. If they understand, you know, we we always employ the whole part whole learning process. So we listen to the whole, we experience the whole in as many ways as we have time for. Then we look at the parts. So what are the rhythm patterns? What are the tonal patterns? We may improvise with some of the rhythm patterns. Um, and then we go back to the whole, but now with more understanding because we've seen the parts. And that's it. And then we send the student away. We usually send the student away with some listening assignments because listening is, is a big part of developing our ear and then they come back the next time and it's all over the same process all over again and kids are loving it it's that's a huge part of why i want to do this because i see a lot of uh acceptance and it, it's just the, the most natural way for a child to learn mm -hmm. so now when you send them home in traditional lessons they have an assignment that they're supposed to practice at home yeah. and you give them listening assignments, but is there, do they have specific things? Like, do they need to learn the notes that they've learned that day or do they need to practice their piece? What does their practicing look like at home? That's an excellent question. And it can look many different ways. And while they are in informal guidance, so we, this, you know, we make a distinction between informal guidance and formal instruction. So informal guidance is when the student is still exper uh, experiencing uh, the instrument, ex you know, learning certain skills. And when they've learned those skills and they're ready for formal instructions, then they are expected to practice and they have specific uh, assignments, uh, not necessarily that have anything to do with reading notes or learning notes, but everything to do with uh, learning functional, you know, functional skills. Uh, okay. le the learning of notes comes a little bit later, maybe in the second year. Depending oh, okay. On the, so if the student is in informal guidance when they're three or four years old, by the time they're six, they can start formal guidance. And by the time they're seven, they can be ready to read notes. And that makes you know, sense. That's kind of developmentally yeah. when they're starting to read words. And so right. that really does yeah. make sense for that to happen. So this instruction Absolutely. starts when they're very young. It starts when they're about three or four. That's ideal. I know it doesn't yeah. always go that way. And when someone is just walking into my studio and they're six years old and they've never had any, you know, they, they haven't had much experience with, with music around them. It's hard for me to explain to the parents where they need to start from. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I would think especially with this informal sort of structure when they're a little bit older, I can see the parents are wanting to have some sort of validation for the investment that they're putting into lessons and, you know, all of those competitions and auditions like you were talking about, give them that external validation. How do you... I guess, quote unquote, sell this to them? Uh, I can give them a lot of things to read. Um, <laughs> that is the reason why I want to start a podcast myself, because this information isn't, it isn't out there enough. I mean, there are a couple of wonderful, wonderful podcasts that are very MLT based or around MLT or are all about MLT. But there needs to be more. <laughs> um, so MLT is more. the music directly learning. Speaks, yeah, that directly speaks to the parents. Um, that oh, you know, I see. directly answers their question that they're asking or potentially asking, um, you know, questions that I've had myself as, as a teacher, as a parent, um, and that have been answered. And, and you know, mm -hmm. it's the answers are out there. There a lot of them are in the research that's been published. But uh, who reads research? You know, the parents probably won't be reading music learning research. No, um, so no, it, no, it's no. a challenge to bring them into this world. It's a challenge to um, ask them to be patient and to give something like this a chance. And I think it's only because everything else is done so differently and they are they they're just brought up to have certain expectations. 
and it it's very difficult to change someone's mind or maybe impossible mm -hmm. yeah yeah so to do it very yeah. slowly mm -hmm. very slowly mm -hmm. right sometimes so mlt halfway. yeah i'm sorry and sometimes meet them halfway you know yes. give them the what they need but also sprinkle um some good stuff <laughs> <laughs> along the line <laughs> so they don't know that they're having it it's like yeah it's like when it's like when you hide something healthy in a brownie or something absolutely zucchini put zucchini in cookies <laughs> there you go <laughs> so just in case just in case uh any listeners are wondering mlt stands for the music learning theory and audiation is a big part of that and as you were talking, I was wondering um, when your kids are in this informal learning, I, you were talking about the improvisation with the with the rhythms. And so if you were to go ba, 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 and they were to answer back, ba, 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 something completely different. Is that something that you encourage with them or are you like, no, listen and try to match? It's just whatever they want. Uh, sometimes we ask them to do whatever they want and uh if they do something that's completely um out of context of what you want them then we just know that they're in music babble and this is the very yeah. beginning um uh, we call it music or music learning theory calls it music babble it's like the first stage of, of everything and it's uh, the same as language babble, you know, after the baby has been listening to lots of adults around them speak the native language, they begin to uh, try to make some sounds themselves and they're babbling. And so this is the same thing with me. They're not yet realizing that they're not matching you exactly. Uh, they don't have that realization yet. So once they do have that realization, both in language and music, then they go to another stage <laughs> and we know that they're in that other stage, but that's still informal. So there's, I think there's five stages to informal guidance um, that they have to go through. And imitation is one and it has to be correct imitation, exact imitation. And, you know, the ability to imitate is definitely uh, a requirement in order to begin to learn to audiate. Mm hmm. Well, it's the same thing with like you gave the um, comparison to speech. They babble and then they imitate and they just copy whatever their parents say. And so you have to be really careful as a parent what you say around oh, your yeah. kids because they're imitating <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to imitate you. So I love how this is so parallel to language development. It's, mm -hmm. is, I just think that's that's fascinating. And another thing that I love, the way that you have structured your lessons, each activity seems to kind of scaffold on the, le the activity before. Yes. And I think that is so, so smart. Like, I just well, love I that. Well, I didn't make it out. <laughs> there's a there's a <laughs> out there. It's called Music Moves for Piano. And it's by Mary Monroe. <laughs> And she she worked with Gordon for many, many years. And she came up with, you know, everything she came up with, I think she ran it through him. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was basically her uh, life's work. Uh, just this method was uh, decades of work. Yeah, it's beautiful. Now, I know that you are meeting some students halfway. I'm just thinking about... Um, just this last week, I have a couple of students and I introduced them to the Dorian mode just for fun. And I said, look how easy and fun it is to improvise in this mode. This will be great. Some of my younger students were like, woo, and they, they were all in it. And then some of my older students were so afraid to play a wrong note. It almost froze them. And I know improvisation is a huge part of, of music learning theory. How do you get your students out of their shell if maybe they're a transfer student to you? Yeah, transfer students are so, so difficult. I've always thought that even before I was an MLT teacher, just transfer students come with whatever they're used to, whatever they've learned. You don't know the environment in which they've been all these years. And they come with certain expectations and uh, certain things that they're willing to do or not willing to do. And for them, there are some wonderful books you know, that have simple enough rote pieces or pattern based pieces that I use to kind of 
tickle <laughs> that ability in them. Uh, sometimes I don't use these books. I just use their pieces and I show them how something can be changed. And I show them how cool it is. Hopefully they think it's cool. They usually do. Sometimes, um, sometimes they freeze and that's a normal, I think, normal reaction when someone is out of their comfort zone and especially a teenager in those years, it's, um, it's just a normal reaction and we have to not push it so hard on them, but we have to keep showing it to them and introducing, reintroducing. And I think the joy that I experience from doing this myself and teaching this is infectious and it, it goes across, <laughs> even across the screen. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's what I can say about it. But it's definitely a challenge. The Chancellor students are yeah. challenging for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think so. And then, um, so you say that there's these phases, there's phases in the informal structure, and then are there phases in the formal structure as well? Once they get a little older and they start, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, once we start formal guidance, we expect them to actually start building a rhythm and tonal vocabulary. And we start with tonic and dominant for tonal, and then we add subdominant, and then we go to different modes after that. And they learn to improvise and, and compose in all these different scenarios. Um, and But again, it's cyclical in the way that uh, the, the method itself keeps bringing back all pieces, all, you know, a lot of them are familiar folk twos that uh, kids grew up with or are growing up with. Um, and... That's yeah. that's a great thing because they have these twos uh, as sort of their native vocabulary, and then they learn to to change them in so many ways. So it progresses very um, very logically, and when you get to I think year two or year three of formal instruction, it's when you're supposed to introduce formal reading. But again, as I said, you can do this as you like, really. I mean, Gordon found that uh, decoding notation, learning to read notation, uh, um, you know, is in the way of developing audiation. Um, I think he proved that in many ways. And I think we, I mean, I've seen this in my students over the years, that as soon as you put something up there, and it's a symbol that they have to decode and they don't really understand. You know, they're just reading the pitches and the contour, maybe the intervals, but that's it. They're not anticipating musically what's going to happen in the music. They're not recalling and and um, recognizing patterns that they've heard before. That becomes a real problem because then they're not connecting anything that they already know to what they're trying to to the unknown, what they're trying to figure out that's in front of them. Mm. So how do you, how do you go, how do you get over that hurdle once you start introducing yeah. the notes? Well, in MLT, we also have um, <laughs> on one side, discrimination learning, and on the other side, inference learning, and we bridge between the two all the time. So discrimination learning is when the teacher basically gives the answer. Um, and that has many stages of development as well. And then inference and learning is when the student finds the answer themselves. So you can go this way, you know, through all the stages of discrimination and then go to the, all the stages of inference, but it's better if you go back and forth and that, it, you know, you can always go here where the inference learning is. You can always see what the student can do at any given moment, what, how much they can figure out on their own and then go back to, you know, spelling it all out for them. So, you know, I can say, bum, 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 and I can say, don't me so, and then I can show you don't me so, or I can show you at least don't me so on my fingers, finger staff. Um, and then that translates onto the actual staff. And that's how we go from one place to the other back and forth. And then, you know, I can say, can you improvise with do being so? And then I can say do is G, right? Mm -hmm. And so on. So we can take it just a little bit deeper or we could take it a lot deeper. Gotcha. Okay. 
And then you just do that based on seeing where they are versus yes, you always. feeding them the answers. And then that's how you can just adjust and kind of fit it to yes, where they are. And, and that's very difficult. It's a much more difficult job as a teacher. Yes. Um, to constantly assess students and to practice differentiation in, uh, in instruction, even when you're in a group setting, to know, for example, if a student uh, has a lower rhythm aptitude versus a student that has a higher rhythm aptitude, then aptitude is, is your natural ability, inborn ability, <clears throat> and you can affect it. You can uh, make it better if you start early. Uh, but then, you know, you're not going to throw some complex rhythm pattern at the student that has the lower rhythm aptitude. And you're definitely going to challenge the student that has a higher rhythm aptitude. So that's a whole nother area that you really yeah. have to know where you are, uh, what you, how you're sequencing. Um, you know, Gordon has a, a sequence in teaching rhythm and teaching tonal patterns as, as well as everything else. So it's not just the sequence of, of the audiation building sequence, but it's also the skill itself has a sequence. Each skill okay. has a sequence. So how does technique fit into all this, like scales, arpeggios, all that? Is that an important part of this or is this more, much more no, of music, music appreciation? It's hugely important. Yeah. Um, yeah I too. think for... Yeah, for maybe for some teachers, it, it's not that important. Uh, but for me, and, and I think that's where I see a lot of uh, opportunity because the student is the student's vision is not occupied necessarily with anything that they're having to decode. The, their mind is not occupied with symbols and, uh, you know, translating those symbols into whatever they're doing. Uh, it's simply they're engaging their ear and they're paying attention to their body movements. And they're also getting feedback from, you know, from the instrument and from the way they move, what kind of movement uh, or what kind of feeling produces what kind of sound constantly. And we do, I think, spend a lot of time on this, experimenting with, with sounds, exploring what our instruments, what our bodies can do and... Uh, I see it as, as a huge opportunity rather than the other way around. I, I often found it difficult to teach technique while teaching note rating, while teaching rhythm counting, and while teaching music theory, while just teaching everything all at once. <laughs> yeah, and technique is much easier to learn without the notes there, without the music on the page. Okay, so how does all of this work with technique, you know, with like scales and arpeggios? Where does that fit into all this music theory, music learning theory? Yeah, so I see it as an opportunity because we are not occupying the student's mind and vision with a score, with music notation uh, or counting or, you know, any of the things that we usually teach the student right from the beginning. We, uh, you know, the the student's eyes and mind is available to concentrate on how the instrument works, how their body uh, fits with the instrument, what they do, how the instrument responds to what they do, um, how they, you know, how an action gets a reaction yeah. from the instrument. Yeah. And that's, you know, that feedback is of utmost importance because, um, you know, from the very beginning, because I think one, obviously it teaches the student proper technique, but two, it's what I noticed with my own two daughters is that they're not afraid of the piano. The piano is a very large instrument. It can be, especially if you have a, a grand piano at home. And by learning to manipulate it successfully and learning to explore the entire keyboard, that's another problem I have with a lot of methods that begin in the middle because, you know, you can only teach so many notes at once to read and the student plays what they can read. And then that because the a problem, because it restricts movement. And when you restrict movement, um, you restrict technique and you get a lot of kids that form tension in the way they sit at the piano, the way they use their body. Because of that, it's just like an outcome of this, these methods that begin in the middle or that begin with a very narrow range of pitches. Mm -hmm. Also, not good but for then, the 
<laughs> to, no, I would think not. That's a very narrow uh, range of pitches, you know. <laughs> that's true. And I think if you take the music away when you're teaching, especially scales, you can really work on the proper technique using your arm, using your wrist. And um, I see a lot of tension in students' hands and in their fingertips and a lot of just not strong fingertips that really inhibit them. But when you can just teach that by imitation or by experimentation, then they can really concentrate on the sounds that they're that they're making and it ends up with better technique in the end that way. I think so. That's been my experience so far. Yeah. So now how did you become this type of teacher? It sounds, some of the things sound very intuitive, the things that work really well with the way that we work as teachers just in general. Um, but a lot of it sounds like you need some pretty good training. How did you get involved with this type of teaching? Well, I had been maintaining a very full studio for many years and I was burning out. <laughs> to be quite honest, I was just burning out what, doing what felt to me like it was the same thing. Um, so I myself was looking for more meaning in my profession. I was looking for greater impact for the student. I was genuinely interested how, you know, in how can I make this better for the student? So it was, it was and, a very natural development for me in my career. So how did you find the training? That's a great question. I think it was someone on Facebook in one of those piano forums that was well I, in fact i think it was one of my kids piano teachers at the moment she's an mlt teacher i think it's it was Anne catherine davis and she had posted something and she repeatedly posted something about the method and about music learning theory and it got my attention if if someone else is wanting to get this training and learn about um about audiation and all this types of this method of teaching how can they learn more about it there are facebook groups um i can give you the you can put them in the show notes if, if you'd I like <laughs> there's um uh, it's called music learning academy that's where i took courses in actually using the piano methods the only piano method to this day that's been uh, made after music learning theory and there are also podcasts, a couple of podcasts that uh, you guys can listen to. Uh, one is, uh, I think, Everyday Musicality is what, where it's specifically MLT based. It just talks about every single tenet of MLT. Um, and the other one is Keys to Music Learning. I think something like that. But it's um, that's more community based and it you know, has interviews with other teachers using music learning theories, uh, theory in their teaching exclusively or, or not. And then you'll be having a podcast soon, right? Yes. Yes. Mine is going to be more about teaching, specifically teaching piano through the MLT lens. Uh, but also it's going to be directed toward parents and also you know, uh, teaching about early childhood and what, what parents can do when they have babies and how they can prep them <laughs> in the best possible way for music. <laughs> Which will help them their entire life, even beyond the scope of music. Yeah. <laughs> well, My gosh, this has... Yeah, so blessed to have discovered this. And I, I wish I had discovered it just a little bit earlier because my older oldest daughter is eight and it's been about four years for me I wish I'd known this when she was a newborn so that oh. I can start to apply all of that you know but she's reaping the benefits even at this age truly oh yeah I'm sure she is I'm she's still young she's still so young yeah absolutely. I'm <laughs> well Siliana this has been just so eye-opening. I'm going to go and listen to some of those podcasts and learn a little bit more about this because um, I think that there are definitely some of these aspects that I can bring into my own teaching and probably my own playing, to be honest. I know I'm a little older than eight, but I'm sure that there are some of these things that I can do. Do you have any advice for new musicians, aspiring musicians that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I would say 
I would give the advice I gave to myself, <laughs> which is open mind. And this was something difficult for me in the beginning. I knew I needed something more, but I still was stuck in my old ways for a while. And I questioned everything. Uh, and I think an open mind really helps you absorb this much faster. And it, it helps you, you know, just not, it, it helps you learn something new without being any kind of a judge while you're doing it. So not judging and not putting something new against something old, but just taking in the new thing and just just taking it in for what it is <laughs> and that's how it works because it, it's miraculous and it's how music was originally taught so in the baroque period and the classical period and all of those periods people learned music this way they didn't decode notation they learned by ear they learned to sing they they were dancing they were a absorbing much 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 music before they touched an instrument and it, it was just a very much similar process to you know to what we now call music learning theory and audiation uh, it's basically how people learned before something happened a hundred years ago and it was so important to learn to read notation you know as a young child but I don't believe this is the most natural way to approach music. So keep an open mind. That's that's really the best advice I can give. And and dig yeah. in. There's so much out there. So much research. Yeah. Well, Siliana, thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate your time. This has been very eye-opening to me. Um, and I just appreciate you coming and talking with me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was such a joy. <laughs>